Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today um, for CPEN's 2022 Health Equity and Racial Justice Policy Mixer. We're going to give folks a couple minutes to continue to get, get into the right Zoom room and then we'll get started. So thanks for your patience. Thank you so much for, for being here today. And special welcome to, I see a couple former CPEN staff that we have on here, which is so exciting. Special welcome to those folks as well. All right, welcome again. Thanks everyone for joining us. We're gonna let folks continue to make their way into the Zoom room, but we're also gonna go ahead and get started because we have a really packed agenda. We have a lot of um, exciting speakers and, and updates to share with you all. Um, so I'm Kieran savage Sangwan. I'm the Executive Director here at CPEN. I really have the privilege of getting to lead this amazing organization. Wanna give a big shout out and thanks to our entire staff and board team that worked so hard to put on this event today. None of our work at CPEN would be possible without them. So huge thanks to our CPEN staff and board. Um, so when folks registered for this event, we asked what your vision for an equitable and just world looks like. And folks had so many amazing responses that we also want to invite you to share those visions in the chat and also to share those um, messages of hope on Twitter using our hashtag for this event, which is hashtag CPEN4, number four, equity, CPEN4, equity. Um, for today, because we have a large group, everyone has been placed into listen only mode, and we welcome you to use the chat. If you have a question or a comment, um, please feel free to do that. Please also go ahead and drop your name, your pronouns, and where you're joining from um, into the chat so we can get a sense of everyone's in every, everyone who is in the virtual room with us. This event is being recorded and we will make the, the recording, the slides and the materials available after the event. Closed captions are available for those that may wish to use those and instructions for closed captions are on the slide um, that you should be able to see in front of you right now. Um, so again, please please drop your, your introduction into the chat. We'd love to know who we're sharing the space with this evening. Thank you so much for being here. And I have the privilege now of introducing our CPEN board chair, Ian Rick John. Um, Ian has been our board chair for about a year and a half now. Is really very committed to CPEN and a huge part of what enables us to do the work that we do. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ian um, to welcome you all. Great, thank you, Kieran. And good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, as Kieran mentioned, my name is Ian John and I serve as the board chair for CPEN. Um, I currently teach at Cal State University East Bay in the Department of Public Health. And until 2020, I worked for seven years as a policy analyst and strategist for one of the founding organizations of CPEN, uh, the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum based in Oakland. Uh, so th for those of you who are not familiar with CPEN, uh, we were established 30 years ago in 1992 after the police beating of Rodney King. And ethnic health leaders from the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, the California Black Health Network, uh, California Rural Indian Health Board, and the Latino Coalition for a Healthy California came together and founded CPEN as a multiracial advocacy organization dedicated to championing health equity and racial justice. So tonight you'll hear from CPEN staff, elected officials, health department staff, uh, and our community partners. We'll be announcing our 2022 slate of health equity and racial justice proposals. Uh, each of these bills and budget requests seeks to transform the healthcare system address systemic racism and overcome barriers to healthcare and other services uh, that impact the health of our communities. So I really wanna thank you all for being here. And now I'll pass it off to another CPEN board member, uh, Elena, Elena Santamaria. 
Thank you, Ian. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elena Santamaria, and I'm a policy advisor with NextGen Policy and a CPEN board member. CPEN has always been so unique, not only due to its founding story, but also because of its network model. Tonight, you'll learn more about how the network differs from a coalition and how CPEN seeks through the theory of change to empower people of all walks of life to be an advocate for their own health and community. CPEN and all of our organizations could not do this work without our partners from Black, Indigenous, communities of color, LGBTQ plus communities, differently abled communities and undocumented and refugee communities. We hope whether you are a new friend or old, you'll learn something new and feel compelled to take action after this event. And I'll pass it back to Kieran. Great, thank you so much, Elena and Ian um, for those remarks. So now I'm really pleased to introduce our first awardee of the night, um, Dr. Joaquina Rambula, who's our assembly member representing the 31st district. Dr. Rambula has been a champion of health for all and a strong voice in the capital for using California's immense resources and funds to help the most marginalized communities. Dr. Rambula is also a strong supporter of community-based organizations, working closely with partners in his district to educate, to vaccinate, and to provide resources to um, friends and neighbors in the region. Um, at CPEN, we've been very privileged to be able to work closely with Dr. Rambula on a number of important health equity issues over the years, from mental health to health navigators to coverage for our undocumented communities, and couldn't be more thrilled to have such a champion in the legislature. Um, so we really want to, to honor Dr. Rambula with our CPEN Health Equity and Racial Justice Champion Award. Um, so please give a big shout out to Dr. Rambula, and we'd like to welcome him now to give a few remarks. Thank you, Kieran, and what an honor it is to be able to be here with you today and to have an opportunity to speak, especially if I can, to CPEN, who has been a champion for health equity for many years. I am honored to be here with you all, advocates, community partners, fellow legislators who I saw on as well. A few years ago, I made the decision to leave the emergency room in Selma, which is in the San Joaquin Valley. It's the raising capital of the world, if you don't know where it is. And that's where I practiced medicine for almost a decade. But I made the decision there to run for office because it was in the ER that I was treating patients one by one. And I felt that there was more that needed to be done at a systemic level. Many people who came to the ER as their only option for medical care and the community that I cared about was farm working, predominantly Latino with little to no health insurance to support them. It became clear to me that we are facing a huge problem in the San Joaquin Valley and the rest of the state. Working in this emergency room allowed me to serve my community, but it also allowed me to see firsthand the problems that affect the health of our people. California cannot and should not to return to how we were before the pandemic. Now is the time for us to be anti-racist, to be intentional, and to invest in all Californians' essential needs to achieve equity in healthcare access. We must come together and combine our efforts to make Californians healthier and make our society a more just place for all. I thank you again for this recognition and the opportunity to speak. I look forward to partnering with you this upcoming year with AB 2680. And it's finally time for us to get to Health for All that we have been working together with you for the last several years. Thank you for the honor and the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us. And thank you for your leadership and your vision in the state legislature. And really, I think, as one of our primary champions on these really important issues. So thank you again. Thank you for, for being in this fight with us. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our, our other awardee of the evening. Um, I, we recognize at CPEN that it takes great legislative champions, and it also takes great champions within the administration and our departments and agencies to move forward on the type of work that we want to move forward. So I'm very excited, thrilled really, to introduce Dr. Rohan Radhakrishna, who was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom to lead the Office of Health Equity, I guess almost a year ago now, spring of 2021, and was recently confirmed um, in that role by the State Senate. 
Um, Dr. Rohan strives to uphold the universal values of love, dignity, and transformation. He believes that inequity in a world of abundance is morally and socially unacceptable, and he aims to advance partnerships to change narratives and power structures to help create a California for all. And just over the last year, I can say, in having the opportunity to work with him, we've really seen um, these values and commitments um, in his work. He has decades of experience working at the county level, working as a healthcare provider, working in county public health um, on a number of issues, and is really bringing, I think, that experience and that commitment to the state. We're very fortunate to have him in this position where he's already, I think, doubled the size of the office, been able to really um, be instrumental during the pandemic. And so we would like to um, present our uh, second award, our CPEN Health Equity and Racial Justice Champion Award to Dr. Rohan Radhakrishna and um, ask him if he'd like to offer a few remarks. Thank you so much, Kiran, C. Penn, Assemblymember Arambula. My name is Rohan and I stand for love, dignity, and transformation and have a similar story to Assemblymember Arambula of not being able to tolerate the downstream suffering one by one and the need to move upstream to address the systemic factors that can help create health. I cannot accept this award as an individual, noting I stand on the shoulder of giants who have been doing this work for decades, many of you attending this event today. But I am willing as the new kid on the block to humbly accept this award as part of California's health equity movement, which includes many who are both inside and outside of our institutions and government. Thank you, CPEN, for this award. I'm so grateful for all of your work and partnership. Much has been said during this pandemic about the disparities and inequities experienced by people of color, those with limited English proficiency, people who are undocumented, differently abled, or who identify as LGBTQ+. But much less attention has been paid to the strength, resiliency, and innovative solutions that communities already held within them to face such challenges from community vaccine clinics, to educational webinars, to serving as food and resource hubs, community organizations and advocates have been helping meet the needs of their neighbors long before the pandemic. The work of community reminds me of one of my newest favorite quotes that comes from an article on preventive mental health. Here it goes. Risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. Let me say that again. Risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. Community resiliency amplifies the protective factors to overcome the risks of systemic and structural discrimination and oppression that will take time to dismantle, rebuild, and transform. Thank you, community partners, for all that you do every day. I'd like to end by briefly honoring two of my mentors who I had the privilege to learn from and who passed away recently. The first is Paul Farmer, an anthropologist and physician who said, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong in the world. He taught us to champion culture as health to elevate grassroots expertise and to empower community health workers, all things that CPEN promotes in California. Second, I'd like to uplift the spirit of the peace activist, mindfulness master, and Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who taught us about interbeing and our deep interconnectedness. A cloud brings rain, fills reservoirs, becomes our drinking water, enters our body, and as we exhale, that moisture rebuilds the clouds. We enter R with clouds and we enter R with each other. Our suffering and our salvation is inextricably bound. COVID has brought us closer for we can only truly be healthy if all community members are healthy. May we continue their work in the spirit of love and compassion. And I'll end by sharing my pride to be a partner with CPEN in this movement so we can together chart the course of history 
and bend the arc towards justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Radhakrishna, for those really powerful words and also for bringing some of our ancestors and leaders into the room with us. I really appreciate that and appreciate your leadership and partnership with the state. So thank you so much. I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, our Managing Director of Policy, Ronald Coleman. Thank you so much, Kieran, and thank you, Dr. Radha Krishna, for your kind words. We very much appreciate all your work in leadership. Ronald Coleman here, Managing Director of Policy with the California Pan Ethnic Health Network. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Richard Pan, Senator from the 6th District representing Sacramento. Senator Pan is the author of CPEN's sponsored bill, SB 1033, which seeks to enhance and standardize data to improve health outcomes. Senator Pan, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so very much for the introduction, Ronald, and uh, thank you so much for having me and being part of this wonderful uh, 2022 policy kickoff event for CPAN. And I do want to congratulate the award winners, both uh, Dr. Zarambula and Dr. Rohan. I uh, appreciate uh, your remarks, and uh, actually it's interesting, I think we all have similar stories. I, as a pediatrician, uh, uh, taking care of Medi-Cal patients, uninsured patients in my clinic, uh, to foster kids, uh, also recognizing that there were too many kids who didn't have health insurance and uh, as a physician uh, worked to uh, establish our children's health initiative, five counties hoping 65,000 uh, uh, families, uh, children get health care coverage uh, before uh, I came into legislature. And of course, coming into legislature had the, the opportunity to, first of all, of course, working on ACA implementation. And then of course, and, and again, I want to recognize Dr. Ambula's uh, leadership role and saying that we also need to uh, expand that coverage to include people who are undocumented, which, by the way, were the people that the uh, health initiative I worked on before I was in the legislature was targeting as well, right? Uh, because those people didn't qualify for existing programs. And so, uh, and I know that CPEN's always been a strong advocate of that kind of work to empower California's marginalized communities. And certainly it's an honor to, to work with you again. Now, uh, one way we ensure our communities is our scene is being sure we have accurate data. And in fact, as chair of the Asian American Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, we've recognized how important data is to ensuring that the unique needs of the AAPI community are met. In fact, a challenge that we see is, is that oftentimes we know the disparities are there and we often talk about them, but if they're not even visible because we don't have data, then we can't address the disparities. And, and certainly for the API community, far too often our disparate communities that have come together under the API umbrella, fortunately are too often lumped together or called are classified as other. And we don't see the differences and the diversity within our umbrella. And so uh, the particular needs of community, sub communities in the API community, unfortunately become neglected and not seen, become invisible. As a result, those individual disparities cannot be addressed. So certainly as a physician, chair of the Senate Health Committee and former health services researcher, I understand firsthand how not having accurate data can become a life and death situation. And of course, while I'm certainly proud of the work that I've done to get more people healthcare coverage, but if we don't have data to identify what the disparities are, so it's great to have coverage, but coverage is not enough. And I think we know that. And so if we, that coverage doesn't result in us having the information about what's going on, then we can't solve the problems that are facing us, the disparities. And that's why California has required health plans to collect this aggregated data, but that data is not being cons collected consistently or uniformly. That makes it di difficult for the state, for all of you as advocates to actually identify the disparities and gaps that we need to identify, to, to close and to address. And that's why I'm proud to be your uh, to author SB 1033, uh, the bill that you're sponsoring, the Advancing Health Equity in, with Data Bill. This bill strengthens the standards for collecting demographic data and community needs. It's the first, it's a, a first step in addressing disparities to, by first being able to identify it, to make them visible, so that they we know what they are. And obviously, the work is still before us then to address and close those disparities to eliminate those disparities. But this is our first step. This bill will ensure that data reflects the diversity and the true needs of all Californians. So again, thank you so very much for having me here. Thank you for picking me to be your author for your sponsored bill. I look forward to us uh, 
continue, making sure that this happens and continuing to be sure that we first identified disparities and then of course do the hard work of closing them to achieve true equity for California. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pan. We very much appreciate all your leadership on so many equity priorities over the year, uh, including the, the sponsored bill we'll be working on together, and then also bills like SB 17 on the Office of Racial Equity. Now I'd like to introduce Senator Lena Gonzalez, Senator of California's 33rd District. Uh, Senator Gonzalez is the author of CPEN sponsored bill SB 1019. SB 1019 will strengthen mental health access for Medi-Cal members with mild to moderate mental health care needs. Senator Gonzalez is a champion for workers, environmental justice, LGBTQ plus issues, and we are happy to have her here with us today. Senator Gonzalez, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, thank you, Ronald, and hi, CPIN friends. And I want to thank my, my incredible colleagues, Dr. Uh, Pan and Dr. Rambula. I certainly learned a lot from them, especially being on the health committee. I go to them a lot for um, lots of questions, but especially for, for ensuring that all Californians have access to good and quality health care, regardless of what their plan looks like. Um, having family members myself who are on Medi-Cal and, and need that support, I'm just really glad to partner with each and every one of you to address those needs through SB 1019, which will hopefully strengthen access to mental health services for diverse communities like the one I represent in Long Beach and Southeast Los Angeles, and ensure that their responsibility to reduce barriers and increase equitable access is the state's responsibility. Um, the enrollees that are on Medi-Cal deserve to really know about their coverage, their rights to timely and respectful care, and especially deserve culturally and linguistically relevant and accessible information. Having a, a district like mine that is not only Latino, very strong Latino, but also there's a large refugee Cambodian community who never ever sees folks that look like them in the system and who also wants uh, medical access to be able to have um, opportunities for mental health. I see that a lot. They talk to me about the mental health, lack of support that they, that they um, so de desperately need. So I look at this in a, in a lens that is just so wide and, and having such a diverse um, community that I know that this bill can help, um, especially uh, mirrored with so many other bills that you've been working on. So with that, I wanna say thank you for allowing me to author as well. And congratulations to Dr. Rohan and Dr. Rambula as well for being honored. Thank you so much, Senator Gonzalez. Thank you for being here with us today and thank you for your leadership. And also thank you so much to um, Dr. Pan, who I know is finishing up his time in the legislature and we will miss very much, but I know won't, won't be far away as, as an ally and leader in this work. Um, so thank you also for your tremendous leadership over the last few years. Um, so now I have the immense privilege of introducing one of our close partners at CPEN. Um, this person and her organization really, I think, are, are the best of, of what we do and what we think of with our network model and um, the way in which um, they bring people together, both in the Black community, but also across communities, populations, and cultures, really inspiring. And so I'm really pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Sonia Young Adam from the California Black Women's Health Project, where she's the CEO. She's led this organization through tremendous growth, um, reaching out across the state from their home in LA, reaching out across the state to empower and uplift um, Black women through their sister circles, through Sisters Mentally Mobilized. And she's also a tremendous voice and really a force um, for racial justice and, and health equity in state policy discussions. So I'm so pleased to introduce my friend, Sonia. And Sonia, please take it away. Hi there. Wow, Karen, I'm so honored. Just such a great introduction. I really appreciate it. I really want to just congratulate Dr. Zarangula and, and uh, Dr. Radhakrishna. I mean, such an honor, but so well deserved. I mean, the the two of you. I mean, Dr. Pan, I, really. And then to see our senator from, you know, down here in Long Beach. I mean, it really is just a great, great evening. So thank you very much. Um, again, good evening to everyone. I'm Sonia Yangadam. I see a lot of people in this gloom that I know, um, and it's really good for us to all be together. And of course, the CPEN staff, I mean, they're just amazing. I can't believe like in, in the last two years, we have been distanced from one another, but we have gotten so close because we've spent so much quality time together and I appreciate it. Um, so you've heard about CPEN's unique model now, this network as opposed to coming together in coalitions. 
um, and a network is different from a coalition in that it is a more flexible gathering of folks pursuing a variety of goals as opposed to singular ones. I very strongly believe in collective engagement and how we come together. We have maybe multiple um, agendas, and I don't mean that to be facetious, but multiple agendas and issues, but we are connected because we are all centering justice and equity and better health and wellness for um, our communities across the state of California. California Black Women's Health Project is proud to be a member of three of CPAN's networks, Having Our Say, the Behavioral Health Equity Collaborative, or BHEC, and the Racism as a Public Health Crisis, some of our more challenging work, I will say, um, just you know, from my vantage point. But collectively, these networks seek to train, educate, and empower, and mobilize partners across the state for better health outcomes for racial justice. Through these networks, organizations, you know, even like ours, you know, have had so many opportunities to meet with legislators, have advocated for better state and local policies that center equity and the needs of our communities, and participated in gatherings and gathering information for critical needed reports on mental health access and more. And we are proud to have been a partner with CPEN on so much work in the area of mental health for our community. And it just, it means a great deal. I've learned a lot from CPEN and the work that we've done together and I really appreciate it. So spaces like these are so necessary to uplift our collective voices, hold those in power accountable and to change health and justice outcomes for the better. And so in this space, I just like to invite some of you if you'd like to share your experiences. So you can unmute if you want to and just talk about your experience with Sequence Networks or you can chat course in the uh, chat box if you want to share about your organization's experiences um, with CPEN. But we're so proud to be a part of the networks and I appreciate this space and the evening that we're having together. Is there somebody who would like to share? Is there an opportunity for that? Thank okay. you, Sonia, definitely. Right. And was someone, did someone try to unmute? I'm going to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia, for your um, for your really inspiring words. I think we might be having a little tech challenge with unmuting, so we will work on that. But really appreciate appreciate your partnership, appreciate your powerful words. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, um, Joel Jenkins, who's our community advocacy manager here at CPEN, to talk a little bit about um, some of our network work and also to introduce some of our partners. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karen, and great to see you, Sonia, and so many of our community partners. Um, my name is Joel Jenkins. I use he, him pronouns, um, and I have the honor of leading the Having Our Say Coalition, um, and I'm joining you from the unceded land of the Ohlone people in Berkeley. Um, so one of the really amazing things about the work that we're able to do with Having Our Say is um, the thought is there are so many different diverse experiences that we all have um, that are connected by certain societal inequities. So if we bring everyone to the table, um, then we can make sure that the voices of our communities make it up to Sacramento and we have more of a bi-directional conversation. Um, so having our say seeks to do that. Um, the coalition was founded in 2007 um, and uh, really, we look to have a social determinants of health um, or think of all of the different factors that go into whether or not um, communities of color are sort of in survival mode or um, if we are at a place of being able to thrive. Um, with that in mind, um, I would really like to highlight the experience of um, one of our most highly engaged uh, partners. Um, this is work that's done in the Central Valley. Um, so specifically, um, I would like to uplift the work of the Central Valley Immigrant Immigration Collaborative, um, also known as CIVIC. Um, they are currently celebrating eight years of service to communities of color in the Central Valley. Um, and um, in that vein, um, I would like to make sure that CIVIC can speak to the work that they do. 
Um, so I would like to invite Dr. Jesus Martinez, um, who is the executive director at Civic, um, just to share a little bit about the work that they do. Joel, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Civic was created in 2014, and um, I don't know about the rest of you who may belong to organizations that also have been created in recent years, but we still feel that we're an organization that's still in diapers, learning uh, basic things, uh, establishing new partnerships, uh, becoming engaged in important issues that come up. So for us to be part of CPEN and having our say coalition, I think it has been extremely important because we have learned to address issues and to rely on the network to be able to provide resources, information, to be updated on policy developments, to become engaged in those policy activities. Without um, your support, without your resources, without your involvement, we would not be able to provide the type of services and information that we deliver to the Central Valley communities here in the, cent in, in the Central Valley, and also to work with local level partners that are not part of the CPEN network. So I just want to um, really highlight the importance of our membership in, in CPEN and having our say coalition, because without you, we could not really exist as an organization. We would not be able to meet our mission of coordinating and collaborating with partner organizations throughout the Central Valley and, and beyond. We do not have the capacity to become engaged in a full-time basis with policy developments in Sacramento. That's where you as, an, as a network really become so valuable to organizations like us that work at the local regional level. So uh, I know there are a lot of other partner organizations that we work with on an ongoing basis. I also like to thank you for continuing to partner with us whenever possible. And uh, I'm sorry that our other staff members, Clarissa, Vivian, and Ana Alfaro are not able to join the, today's meeting. They are starting at this moment our Immigrant Entrepreneurship Weekly class. So I'm about to join them also in a few minutes. But thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and honor for us to be part of this network. Amazing, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Martinez. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic to my colleague, Ale, to talk about BHAC. Thank you, Joel. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Ale Fernandez Garcia. I use they, them pronouns. I am the newest uh, team member of CPEN, uh, joining um, as a facilitator of BHEC, which I'm super honored uh, to be joining and be a part of. I am on uh, Nisanan, Miwok, and Maidu lands in Sacramento, California. Um, and I am honored to share a little bit about BHEC. Um, BHEC was established in 2016 um, and focuses on bringing together training um, and empowering partner organizations to engage in mental health and behavioral health advocacy. Um, so from the Mental Health Services Act um, to Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Committee um, to local county health departments, the network organizes and engages at every level. As you can see here on the slide, we have over 30 partners that are truly representative of the different regions of California. And we would not be able to do the work uh, via BHEC without our, our important BHEC partners um, that really uplift so many of the voices and experiences of our communities across California when it comes to mental health and behavioral health. Um, we are really excited to be uh, in the, the development stage right now of so many updates, um, events, and, and policy prioritizations um, and action. So please uh, stay tuned uh, for, our, for our updates uh, from BHEC. Um, and, and to uh, uplift one of our BHEC partners here in the space with us today um, from the Cambodian Family Community Center. Um, they are celebrating their 42nd anniversary, which is really exciting. So shout out to them and all the incredible work that they've been doing since 1980. Um, so I want to uh, pass it over to Sophia Chang, Program Director, uh, Youth and Civic Engagement and Immigration from the Cambodian Family Community Center. Pass it over to you, Sophia. Thank you, Ali. I'm very excited to be with everyone tonight and thank you for highlighting our organization. Um, so yes, we've been around for 42 years. We just celebrated our birthday this past month in February. Um, so um, being in this space has been super uh, exciting for us. And like um, Senator um, 
And Dallas mentioned earlier, a lot of Cambodians do not see people that look like themselves in uh, places where there's, uh, you know, policy uh, being made. So um, here at the Cambodian family, we chose to kind of, you know, take that issue and really work with our community members, meet them at their level and encourage them to um, participate in um, a policy change within their communities. So um, a really big thing we do is we uh, take our community members and have them talk about their mental health needs. So we've been participating in um, a lot of MHSA meetings with the county, um, and we've been making a lot of strides uh, in terms of having the county be aware of our community and our issues, and we're very proud of our elders who, you know, I'm just thinking back um, before, like probably five years ago when they were, they were terrified, they were scared, um, they spoke only Khmer and we took them to a mental health meeting, a county mental health meeting, and they spoke in, in language, but they said, hey, we have needs and we're here. And, um, you know, lo and behold, we've been getting a lot of resources, a lot of people checking up on us. Um, and we tell them their story is important and um, this is the work that we do. And uh, now they're starting to see that, hey, we have a voice, we're at the table, we're making changes and we have these dire mental health needs and uh, we're working as a community uh, to address these needs. And I think it's, it's great networking with everybody, um, seeing how everyone kind of takes care of their mental health needs differently, but everyone has a voice. Um, so, you know, um, taking from that, we've also transitioned into working with the elders, but also with the youth as well, um, substance use disorder and getting our youth to be engaged uh, civically as well. Um, and we really focus on intergenerational trauma because, you know, our elders have trauma from war, from genocide. So we were really looking forward to doing more work doing that and kind of um, making sure the younger generation kind of understands where this trauma is from and how we can, you know, just better address all these issues. Um, but thank you so much. And, and we're just excited to be in this space and working with everybody. Um, I, I will give it back to you, Ellie. Thank you so much, Sophia. And shout out again to the Cambodian family for 42 years. It's incredible. Um, I will now pass it over to my colleague, Wayne, to introduce uh, your network. Thanks, Ale. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for you know, joining our mixer today. It's really good to see many familiar faces and see the warm messages that you guys are sending in the chat. Um, so my name is Wei Yu. I'm a community advocacy manager with CPEN. Uh, on behalf of our team and also our co uh, coalition partners, I want to share about one of the, the newer and I would say still growing coalition called the Racism as a Public Health Crisis Coalition. Um, I want to first start by sharing just about the background of this coalition, why we um, got to where we are today. Um, so, you know, in July, in July 2020, which was about um, two years ago, um, there's a group of uh, organizations, including CPEN, Black Women for Wellness Action Project, California Black Women's Health Project, uh, Ruth Community Health Center, um, and Public Health Advocates. We collectively sent a letter to um, California's Governor Newsom asking him to declare racism as a public health crisis. Um, at the time, we felt compelled to do this advocacy after seeing you know, the start um, health and social disparities uh, for communities of, communities of color have been experiencing during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also felt um, you know, very inspired by the 2020 uprising to support Black lives, um, address the, the amazing movement that we saw in 2022 address anti-Black racism and police violence. And so I really want to acknowledge that, you know, we are doing the advocacy we're doing today and want to dedicate this to the movement that Black organizers, especially queer and uh, female Black organizers, have been voting for many, many years, if not decades, right, that really led to the uprising in 2020 and, and then inspire us to do this work. Um, so in our initial letter to the governor, we explicitly ask him to do a few things um, outside of acknowledging that racism is a public health crisis that impacts our health. So we asked him to put people first, engage directly with Black communities and organizers, and really avoid a top-down approach to reform. We asked him to prioritize public health and recommit public health's purposes and resources to racial justice 
and address the harmful uh, impact of, uh, impacts that our institutions have um, you know, led to. We asked the governor to reflect on internal and, and, and external policies and procedures at the state government with an anti-racism lens. And last but not least, we also ask for there to be, um, you know, really investment in community health and healing through ongoing budget, legislative, and administrative actions. So I want to re-emphasize these asks because they really have continued to shape how CPEN as an organization engage with our grassroots partners in our coalition spaces and to advocate um, and build with our public health institutions and, gov and governments, right? Um, well, you know, while the governor has not really um, used his executive power to do this declaration, today CPEN and our partners are hoping to continue to really build this movement of um, addressing systemic race, uh, racism at its root cause. Um, so we are continuing, continuing to work with amazing organizers and advocates in the Sacramento space um, and hoping to push for a comprehensive, you know, anti-racism anti -racism policy agenda that has legislations and budget items so we can really rally behind. Um, and finally, I want to really just give, um, you know, a shout out to our amazing partners. So our initial partners, including Black Women for Wellness, California Black Women's Health Project and Roots Community Health Center have continually engaged with us in this uh, in this work. But then we also have really amazing, you know, new partners that have joined our strategy team, including uh, Next Gen California, Advancement Project California, um, Baji, and also Epic. And so um, more to come. And I'll um, pass that back to uh, is it to my team for maybe the next session. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for being here for our event. Um, you know, I think I'm still kind of like just sitting with all of the great speakers that we've had so far and all of the different conversations that we've just had, uh, you know, talking about uh, CPEN's networks. And so I hope that everyone's been enjoying the afternoon or evening so far. Um, you know, and so now we're gonna move into really talking about uh, CPEN's 2022 legislative priorities. And we are so excited to really announce uh, our priorities for this year with our partners. Um, you know, as was mentioned earlier, CPEN, um, you know, is excited to talk about um, issues that really uh, relate to health equity and racial justice. Um, and the large part of our priorities for this year are really seeking to make sure that we start to address these issues and not just talking about, um, you know, like, some of like the band-aid um, type of like formats that folks like to go with, but really talking about what are the root causes of racial inequities that have gotten us to the point where we are today, where we really see, um, you know, communities of color and other historically excluded groups um, being left out of our systems for far too long. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get us started by talking about um, AB 2680. Um, and so Assemblymember Arambula joined us earlier this evening, uh, you know, and mentioned this bill, um, but I really want to talk to you all about what it is that we're trying to achieve here. Um, and so for folks who are not aware, um, health navigators are actually a very, um, you know, successful tactic, um, especially when working with communities of color and making sure that people have, you know, some type of assistance that's coming from their communities to be able to address um, questions that they may have about, uh, you know, how do I fill out an application uh, for healthcare coverage? Uh, what kind of benefits am I eligible for? Um, you know, sometimes folks are not even aware that, uh, you know, thinking through like all these really great historical expansions, uh, like Health for All, you know, what are some of those tactics that we can use to make sure that we're getting information to community members? Um, and so this is really where AB 2680 comes into play. And you know, in California, Medi-Cal serves over 14 million um, Californians. Um, and we're talking about the folks that are the most vulnerable and people who have been historically excluded. And so thinking about low-income Californians, people who speak English as their second language, uh, folks who are immigrants, but overall, 
you know, really communities of color. And now we all know that our, our healthcare systems are set up in different ways that are just not, um, you know, easy to navigate or understand. And there's so many different complex forms that go into it. And so this is what community health navigators are really best positioned to do. Um, and that is working with uh, community members so that they can, you know, understand what kind of health services that they're eligible for. Um, you know, when we're talking about folks who, you know, uh, are really, really rely on our social safety net systems, we have to think about things that are not just creating access, but things that are really supporting our community members. And how are we making sure that we're getting people into the door? How do we make sure that, um, you know, folks understand that, hey, maybe like, you know, something happened like with your Medi-Cal enrollment and you're not understanding what kind of form it is that you need to fill out or the type of information it is that you need to send to make sure that your benefits are still intact. And so, again, this is what navigators, um, you know, really provide to their community members. And they really are an essential step in ensuring that we're improving our healthcare outcomes, um, particularly for communities of color. Um, because without navigators, we really risk leaving behind our most burdened communities. Um, and so that's, you know, a little bit about uh, AB 2680. Um, you know, we're very excited to continue to move this bill forward with Assemblymember Arambula and have this leadership. Um, and I will pass the microphone on to my colleague, Monica. Thank you so much, Andrea. Good evening, everybody. I am Monica Lee. I'm the Associate Communications Director here at CPEN, and I'm here to talk to you about the Health Equity and Racial Justice Fund. Uh, many of you are already familiar. Many of you are already supporting this, and this is our um, ask, our budget request of no less than $100 million directly to community-based organizations, clinics, and tribal organizations. Um, as so many folks have talked about, uh, we know that your organizations do so much. And this was even pre-pandemic, right? It's meeting people where they are, meeting people uh, in their language and with cultural understanding, uh, trauma-informed services. Um, and we know that funding to you all has for too long been inflexible um, and, and really stop and go. Um, and also really uh, earmarked strictly for only certain things. And so this health equity and racial justice fund is so, so important because uh, we know you all need ongoing, ongoing flexible funding. And so we really uh, wanna thank you know Dr. Rambula who's been a really, really big champion um, in talking about the need for this fund for community organizations um, and all the uh, co-sponsors and all of the supporters that we are working with as well. Um, yeah, so I will pass it back to um, Andrea Rivera to talk about our next bill. Well, thank you so much, Monica. Um, and I'm actually very pleased to introduce our last uh, speaker for this evening, uh, Assemblymember Aguiar Curry, um, who is championing AB 2697 related to community health workers and promotores. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Assemblymember, um, and definitely welcome uh, you know, remarks from you and, and talking about our bill. Well, good evening, everyone. And I wanna thank you for inviting me to join you this evening. Um, policy kickoffs are really fun. It's the time of year that we get to hear about everybody else's bill and you know what a bill looks like today may not look like it at the end, but um, the most important thing we need to work together and to make sure that we collaborate to get the best policy that's out there for our, all of our constituents in the state of California. I first of all, wanna thank the California Pan-Ethnic <clears throat> Um, Health Network for continuously advocating for all communities across California, regardless of their zip code, income, gender, ethnicity, or immigration status. You know, when working on uh, legislation, it is vital to create policy that both increases equity and reduces disparities of all kinds, which is exactly what you all do. And that's why I'm so honored to be authoring AB 2697, community health workers and promotoras. Um, CHWs and promotoras usually live in the community they serve, sharing their neighbor's ethnicity, their language, their social and, uh, social and economic status and life experiences. And because of that, they have a unique ability to bring information where it is most needed, especially specifically to where patients live, eat, work, play, and worship. 
We must make sure that they can continue to perform this special role by supporting them with the proper tools and resources through state reimbursements. This legislative uh, session, I'm also working on other bills that will help improve what, how we deliver healthcare. AB 32, many of you have been very supportive on this bill is our telehealth, our healthcare access via telehealth, which will make sure that all telehealth flexibilities that were in place at the beginning of the pandemic remain well after. And we must expand, excuse me, the options for patients to connect with their uh, providers, receive rapid responses for primary care, and meanwhile, minimizing non-urgent visits to the emergency room. Uh, AB 32 is supported by consumer advocates, safety net providers, community leaders, hospitals, educators, and all types of healthcare providers. But I also need you and your network of allies because we are in a fight with the state departments over the cost of access to healthcare. I don't think budget should be an impediment to public health. I've also introduced 1618, AB 1618, which uh, establishes the Office of Healthy Brain Initiative in the California Department of Public Health to conduct all department activities relating to Alzheimer's disease. This bill is so critical to building a California that can support the 690,000 people currently living with Alzheimer's. Given the, the important role of public health entities for individuals impacted by dementia, establishing this office is a natural progression of the state's Alzheimer's work. And we have done some really incredible things and we continue to uh, uh, work to make sure we can help all people. So I look forward to advocating for these bills uh, amongst my colleagues and getting them across the governor's desk. I look forward to working with my colleagues because many of them have some very important legislation that I think is gonna be fun, that we will change the way um, our um, healthcare access is going to be going forward. And I want to thank all of you for always putting my pa our, our, our patients first and for always fighting for health equity and accessibility. And I just want to say, you know, once they, I was asked to do the promotorious bill, I was so excited because um, I helped um, in my local community. I started a Hispanic advisory committee and I started by meeting with our local uh, federal um, health care system here in town. And we started promotorious um, uh, group. And to see some of those women are still working there. It's been maybe 10 years working with the community and they have the vital link for our community to be healthy. And we can see that every day, particularly during the pandemic, how many people they got to go and get um, their uh, vaccinations. So again, I wanna thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, being so supportive of all of us that are doing um, healthcare policy. Um, you know, we try to do the best every now and then we make a little side steps, but we'd love to have any input that you have. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Assembly Member, and thank you so much for joining us and talking about 2697. Uh, we're very excited about that bill and, you know, to have the opportunity to work with you and, and under your leadership as well. Um, Great, so I am going to talk about uh, you know, the rest of uh, CPAN's legislative priorities for the year. Um, you know, and so earlier in the evening, we had Senator Lena Gonzalez join us and talk about uh, some of the issues that we're really hoping to address with SB 1019. Um, and so SB 1019 is really looking at how we can strengthen access uh, to mental health, specifically for communities of color. Um, you know, and this really comes from, um, you know, our understanding of how mental health needs have really drastically increased um, after the pandemic. Um, we understand that BIPOC uh, community members have faced unique mental health challenges following the pandemic, and that we need to be able to do things uh, to increase access for communities of color. But before we do that, we also need to be able to understand what exactly are those barriers and challenges that are preventing our community members from accessing their mental health care? You know, with communities of color, we understand that there's all kinds of other issues that were impacting folks regardless of the pandemic, right? We're talking about stigmas in communities of color. We're talking about, um, you know, uh, folks who speak English as a second language and are limited English proficient and may not have the opportunity to really understand what kinds of services they can access. Um, and so CPAN last fall 
um, actually published a report on this very topic and looking at how we can really increase access for what is called uh, mild to moderate mental health. And this is specifically looking at those mental health needs that are uh, considered uh, you know, not as severe. So talking about things like anxiety, um, things like depression, um, you know, all things that, you know, we've experienced during the pandemic, um, you know, and really understand that our community members um, really need access to be able to ensure that they can take care of their own needs. Um, and so SB 1019 is really that critical first step to understanding how we can begin to reduce barriers and address racial disparities in mental health. Um, and it's really doing a couple of things, right? We're looking at, um, you know, how can we do like an outreach campaign that is culturally, linguistically competent um, and so folks understand these are the kinds of services that they can access. Um, but then also, how do we also create a, an avenue to collect um, uh, information on, you know, what are those challenges that folks uh, come across when they're trying to access the mental health care system? The way that uh, Medi-Cal uh, is set up right now, and particularly uh, Medi-Cal uh, managed care, it doesn't really allow us to uh, get an understanding or a take from patients on, you know, what exactly are those barriers or steps that prevented them from even making an appointment in the first place. And so SB 1019 is really looking at a lot of different things, but overall uh, really trying to address the need when it comes to just increasing access to mental health for communities of color. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about um, one of our other bills, um, and this is SB 644. Um, and this is actually a, a bill that CPEN worked on last year uh, with our partners at Health Access California and Western Center on Poverty. Um, we're continuing the push to make sure that this bill um, had, makes it over the finish line this year. And what we're really trying to do here is try to set up a, a system where Covered California, the Employment Development Department are communicating with one another. And the reason why this is important is because in, you know, in our society, uh, healthcare is deeply linked and tied to your employment status. If you are unemployed or experience reduced work hours, then your availability to get healthcare coverage um, reduces. Um, and that's particularly challenging, um, especially for folks who are low income, communities of color. Um, when we're talking about things like the COVID-19 pandemic that really impacted uh, folks who are a part of the quote unquote essential workforce, which is predominantly folks of color. And what we saw is that people were uh, opting to just go without healthcare coverage um, because they lost their job, um, but they didn't really understand that there are still other options for you to get coverage and that that doesn't really need to be an option, that you have other alternatives. Um, and so 644 is really looking at what can we do to address the safety net issues that relate to this concept of employer-sponsored healthcare coverage, um, you know, and making sure that we set up a system so that folks who file for unemployment, for example, may also get a call from Covered California uh, to let them know about their different options. And so that we can avoid these instances where people go for prolonged periods of time without healthcare coverage. And that ultimately just becomes more costly either to the family or the individual and even to the state. Um, you know, and so we're really looking at um, things that we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic that we really need to address uh, and make sure that they don't continue to be that norm. And because what we don't wanna do, you know, coming out of uh, COVID-19 is revert back to all of the previous systems and infrastructure that we had that just quite frankly are not really working for our, um, you know, historically excluded groups. And so we're really excited to work with Senator uh, Connie Leva on this bill and with our partners at Health Access and Western Center. Um, and then I am going to talk about um, SB 1033. 
Um, and so Senator Penn was able to join us earlier this evening and really talked about the importance of demographic data collection. Um, you know, and so I will keep uh, this one a little bit, uh, this uh, presentation a little short, just given uh, Senator Pan's remarks earlier this evening. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, really honing in on something that Senator Pan uh, mentioned earlier today, um, which is the need for demographic data and why it is so important, um, especially for communities of color, LGBTQ plus communities, uh, and disabled communities as well. And the fact is that the way that um, our systems are currently set up, uh, data is really what drives uh, uh, resolutions and solutions. Um, and in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have robust data that really reflects all of the different challenges that folks are facing. Um, and not just talking about demographic data that is like race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, but how do we also start to collect data that reflects concepts of like the social determinants of health and health related uh, social needs. Um, and so SB 1033 is really looking at how can we advance equity or health equity with data. And so we're really excited to work with Senator Pat on this bill, um, you know, and, and deeply understand that when it comes to some communities, there are some folks that are really left out. Um, you know, and with Senator Penn's leadership and, um, you know, different members in, in the API caucus, we're very excited to push this uh, issue forward this year. And if we can go on to the next slide. Great. Uh, and so I am going to pass the microphone back to Kieran. Great. Thank you all. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you for um, for listening to our uh, excellent speakers. Big thanks to all of our speakers for your participation. Um, I really want to um, offer folks the opportunity, if you're not already connected with CPEN and our network, please sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social media so that you get all of the updates and opportunities to take action on these important policy issues. Each and every one of you is an agent for positive change in your communities, with your families, at your organizations, and in, elective, in elected office. We look forward to improving the lives of every Californian and making sure your age, race, income, gender, ability, and documentation status do not stand in the way of a long, healthy life. Um, I'm just thrilled to see everyone who's here today, everyone who's participating, and really, none of this work happens without all of the members of our CPEN network and our CPEN family. Um, so thank you so much for being here and for your continued partnership and, and advocacy. Um, we also want to offer folks the opportunity to donate, um, if you wish, and if you have the ability. It's individual donations that allow us to do our legislative and lobbying work, and we've made it really easy. You can scan the QR code here if you'd like to donate to CPEN. Um, so with that said, we are now going to transition. Um, you know, folks are welcome if you've got, I know I've got my little one here. So if you've got other obligations, folks are welcome to um, transition out. But we are also going to offer the opportunity for folks who want to mingle with each other to, um, to get into breakout groups by region, just to sort of meet and greet other folks who are in the room if you're interested. And so those breakout uh, groups should be appearing on your screen and you should be able to choose choose one to go into um, if you're interested, again, in, in meeting um, your colleagues who are also in the room. So thank you again. Thank you from the, from the entire CPEN team um, for being here today and for being champions for health equity. Thank you. <laughs> 